God's there walking side by side with you, and when you're off and you make the wrong decision or something happens, he doesn't walk away. He doesn't say, I'll see you later. He picks you up and carries you. He comforts us, calls us back, leads us, guides us, teaches us where we lack the knowledge that we need to have the relationship he wants to have with us. He bestows his favor Remember, his promise can never be withdrawn or erased. And that is as true today as it was in the Garden of Eden. We see his grace again in the Old Testament, in the life of Abraham and Sarah. Do you remember? God had made a promise. He made a promise to them that they would have a son. They waited and waited and waited and waited. And then they thought, well, you know, maybe we could help God out a little bit. I, we know how to do this. We know how to make babies. So we're, we're going to going to provide for God a surrogate for this son that God had promised us would be ours, but we're going to do this through Hagar. We know what happened with that. I'm not going to go into the story. That's not one of the stories we're going to look at today. But the promise did come to them. We see it in Moses. We all remember Moses, put in the, in the, in the Nile, drawn up, raised in Pharaoh's house, kills a man, runs away into the desert, spends 40 years there, gets to know God, comes back, leads his people out, right? All those wonderful miracles happen. And Moses does one thing, one thing that God tells him not to do. He takes a rock, and he speaks to the rock, and he hits the rock. In his frustration with the Israelites, not even with his frustration with God, in his frustrations with the people that God sent him to lead, he strikes the rock. And because of that, God says, you're not going to get into the promised land. You're never going to get into it. But what does God do for him? Takes him up to the mountain, shows him the promised land, lets him see everything that his people will inherit. The fruit of all the work that Moses did for those 40 years, God allows him to see. And when Moses dies, does he leave him? There's a battle with Satan over his body, and he raises him up, and he takes him to heaven. What grace? I'm going to bet Moses never saw that coming. We see it in his provision for the Israelites for the 40 years that they walked through the desert because of their rebellion. The shoes didn't wear out. They always had food. He kept them safe. Nations were afraid of them, right? We see it on a larger scale when they protected his chosen people from the time of Abraham, from the time that Isaac was born. I'm going to flip it back the other way. I'm sorry, the reverse. From the time that Abraham and Isaac was born to the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ, the whole history of Israel is set. So we have this record that we can refer back to, that we can see the things that God has done in their lives. And then we see it in the New Testament. I want to turn to John chapter 4. John is one of the first Bibles, or first books of the Bible in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Turn with me to chapter 4. We're going to skip around a bit today. That's why I had Jeremy put the scriptures readings up so that if you can't find it in the Bible and can't follow me as I jump all over the place, hopefully you'll see it on the screen. We're going to start with verse 7, and we're going to read through verse 26. I'm going to be reading from the, um, the New King James. John chapter 4, verse 7, and it reads, A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get the living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. 
but the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up to everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go and call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have said well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one with the one whom you now have is not your husband. And that you say truly. Then the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place that we ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I am speaking to you. So let's look at that for a minute. You know, Jesus and the disciples had been traveling from Judea to Galilee. They went through Samaria. The disciples left to go get food and supplies, and Jesus stayed there by the well. And this woman comes up. We don't know her name. We just know her as the Samaritan woman. She comes up to get water, and, and Jesus asks her for a drink. And she's a little surprised because, you know, Jews and Samaritans didn't really get along too well. And, and men and women really didn't converse unless you really knew who had, who knew each other. So she's, a, she's just a little bit surprised. But Jesus knows who she is. Jesus knows her name. He knows her sins. She knows her sins. But he still starts a conversation with her about this living water. And she's taken a, a, a little bit aback, as I said. She becomes just a little bit of defensive, defensive. She asks him almost accusatory, are you greater than our father Jacob? gave us this well? It's as if she's saying, who do you think you are? You can almost hear him chuckling a little bit. Because he knows who he is. And he longs to chuckle with her lack of understanding. He's trying to tease her. He's trying to tell her. But she's thinking, there's this man. He's a Jew. He's got nothing to draw this water out of. How is he going to give me water, let alone living water? Is this better than our father Jacob? But Christ is kind, he's patient, he's understanding. In verse 13 and 14, he tells her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. Whatever this water is, she wants it. Now, she may have wanted it so that she didn't have to go to the well every day. She didn't have to draw the water out. She didn't really care. She wanted that water. It's like, it's like before we had washing machines. Remember, you went down to, well, you probably don't remember, but you went down to the creek and you washed your stuff out by hand. You beat it with a rock and you wrung it out and you hung it over a rock or something to dry. And then all of a sudden, you're saying, well, probably let's wash a couple of curves on the prairie, right? You're still doing it by hand. And then you have these washing machines. How many of you are old enough to remember ringer washers? Remember ringer washers? My mother had it. My mother's tenant had a ringer washer. And you, you, it all washed your clothes automatically, but then, you know, you put it through the ringer so it would squeeze out all the water so you didn't have to be there to squeeze it with your hands. And then we go to these now high-energy efficient washers that your clothes practically come out dry, right? So she's sitting there thinking, I don't have to come up here in the middle of the day because she couldn't go up early in the morning. She was a sinner, right? She couldn't be there. So she had to go up in the heat of the day with these two buckets, probably this big thing hanging off her shoulder. She had to put that bucket down, draw the water up, put the water in the bucket, and then she had to walk it back, and hopefully she didn't spill enough of it that she had to go back for more. And here's this man saying, if I give the water I give you, you're never gonna, it's going to keep coming and coming and coming and coming. And she wanted it. So Jesus tells her, go and get your husband. Come on and we'll talk about it. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> she, like Adam, tries to hide the truth a little bit from God. She tells him the little half-truth. I don't have a husband. Jesus 
confirms and confronts her. He says, you are correct. You have no husband. In fact, you've had five husbands. And the person you're living with now, he's not your husband. Therefore, you're right when you say, I have no husband. Can you imagine her surprise? Now, the townspeople probably knew she had no husband. The townspeople probably knew she had had five husbands. They knew probably more about her than she thought Jesus knew about her. But Christ knows everything about all of us. He can't hide anything from us. She's probably thinking to herself, how does this man know this? Who is he? So what does she do? Instead of confessing and saying, you're right, I don't have a husband, she says, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Let's change the subject here a little bit. Let's take the focus off of me and talk about you. I see that you're a prophet. Where do you think worship should take place? Because we think it should take place here, but, but the Jews, your Jews say it should has, has to take place in Jerusalem. And he responds to her, you don't get it. You think you know what you're doing, but you really don't. And, and you Jews, we know what we should be worshiping, but, but we don't really even understand that. Because, because God is spirit, and there's coming a time, and the time is now that you're going to worship in spirit, not in a temple, not at an altar, made out of stone, but in spirit, so that no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter what's going on around you, you can worship God. In verse 25, she says, I know the Messiah is coming, but can you tell us all things? To which Jesus responds, I am he. At this point, imagine the light goes on in her head. She starts thinking about all the things he said, all the ways that he said them, how much understanding she had when he was explaining things to her. And she realized, this man is special. He, there's, there's something different about him. They go on a little bit further in the chapter, and the disciples come back, and, and you know they see him talking to this woman, and they wonder what's going on, and she takes off. She runs to the townspeople, she tells them everything that's been going on, everything that's happened, everything he said to her, the things he knew about her that she was sure he couldn't know. And she says to them, could this be the Christ? I think she already kind of knew the answer to that. But sometimes we're afraid to say that. We know that Christ is there. We know that Christ is working. We know that Christ is doing something, but we're sort of kind of tentative and we're like, is this the Messiah? Do you think this is him working in my life? We're going to pick the story up in verse 39. So we're, we're still in the book of John. We're still in chapter 4. We're just moving down to verse 39 through 42. So she's told everybody in the town. They all come out. And it says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days. And many more believed of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. You know, what I see when I read this is that, you know, Christ reaches out to everybody that he knows. He didn't stop with the woman at the well. He didn't leave when she ran off to the city. When the people from the city came, he didn't take off and not do anymore. He stayed for two whole days. Two days he stood there and stayed there with them, lived with them, ate with them, shared who he was with them. He is no respecter of our station in life, of our nationality, of the color of our skin, how much education we have, how much understanding we have, whether we're male or female, young or old, whether we believe in him or not. He's no respecter of that. His grace pours out on us no matter what. The next story that we're going to look at is the story of the demoniac. Um, we're going to look in, chat in Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, so turn back one book. Luke chapter 8, and we're going to start at verse 27. So again, Jesus is on the move. He lands on the, on the shore um, of the, the Sea of Galilee. 
starts in verse 27. He says, And he stepped out of, on the land, and there met him a certain man from a city who had demons for a long time. asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons are in him. Not one demon, many demons are in him. And they begged him that they would not, that, that he would not command them out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there in the mountains, so they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. When the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and drowned. 34. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. When they went out to see what had happened, they came to Jesus and found the man who had the demons in part of him, sitting with Jesus, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also who had seen it told them by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of Gerenus asked him to depart from him, for they were seized with great fear. And he got into the boat and returned. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be, go, that he might be with them. And Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. So how do we see God's grace in this? Jesus crossed the disciples. He met this man. He was possessed by many, many demons, the Bible says. We might say he was crazy. He had no clothes. He never bathed. He lived in a graveyard. I mean, basically, that's where he lived, was a graveyard. He had been chained at times, jailed, all to no avail. He broke the chain. He cut himself always driven by his demons back into the wilderness to live like a wild man. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? However, the demons knew who Jesus was. They knew the power that he had over them. And they were afraid. I wonder when this man fell at Jesus' feet, if it wasn't just this small little bit of fire that lit up his hand. I wonder if he used this man as a they had caused this man's life. And yet here they are before Jesus saying, don't torment us, please don't send us out, please, please. Interesting contrast, isn't it? Jesus does have mercy on him, though. He doesn't send them into the abyss, a place of imprisonment where they can't do anything. He, said he allows them to go into this herd of pigs. We all know what happened. They ran over the cliff, they went into the Sea of Galilee, and they drowned. Now I want you to imagine the pig farmers that are there seen all this happen. Here's their livelihood. This is what they did for a living. It's how they made the money. It's how they provided for their family. And there they go, running down, down the cliff, into the water, and they're gone. These men are wiped out. These pigs are dead. So they run away. They run into the townspeople. They tell everybody what's happened. Um, they, they, they bring them back. And what do they see when they get there? There's this man washed, clean, dressed, sane, conversing with Christ. And they're like, whoa, whoa, I don't know how this happened. I don't know who this guy is, but wow. And they're afraid. Why is it that we are afraid of God's mercy and grace when we see it, when we see it in our own lives, or when we see it in the lives of others? We see someone who's forgiven, who's found Christ. Maybe, maybe they were in jail. Maybe they, maybe they killed somebody. Maybe they beat somebody. Maybe they embezzled something. I don't know. But, but God pours out his mercy and grace. They see Christ. They know who he is, and Christ forgives them. And maybe, maybe he lifts them to a place or a position where you 
Someone's brother, husband, father, friend, had been made well. No one was hurt except the pig. They should have been happy. They should have been praising God. Nevertheless, they were afraid, and they asked Jesus to leave. Sometimes when God does miraculous things in our life, we become afraid, and we ask him to leave. I, I, I don't want to. No, no, can't go there. Don't want to do that. We ask him to leave. So he'll go. He doesn't need to go. Just like he didn't take those people away. When this person came to him and said, I want to go with you, please, please, take me with you. Can you imagine? I mean, if you had been healed of something like this, wouldn't you want to stay with the person that healed you? I mean, like this, attached at the hip, right? Never leaving you, never going away from you. You are my shield, my protector. I'm done. I don't want to be with anybody else. But Jesus says, no. he wasn't good enough, but because Jesus knew the work that he had planned for him right there in the city of Jericho. He went out to the cities, he went out to the countryside, he proclaimed the forgiveness and the grace that God had given to him and poured out on him, and he prepared them for a feast of Bible. Can you imagine? Do you think that man knew what was going to happen years later? No. But he went and did what Christ told him to do. We have that same obligation. Christ tells us to do something, he calls us to go somewhere, he calls us to do something, he calls us to be a witness to something we can't do, because we never, never, never know where that call is going to take us or where it's going to lead us. He became a greater witness than he ever could have been by staying right where he was than he ever could have been by sharing him with the disciples. Because they already knew Christ. They already knew who he was. The Jews already were expecting him. book in the New Testament, and we're going to go towards the end of the book in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew's is a little bit, or Peter's is a little bit of a longer story, but she won't tell me I only had till 10 after 12, I'm probably going to go over that, so I just want you all to know. So we're leaving, reading about the life of Peter in Matthew 26, and we're going to start at verse 31. The Jesus, the Jesus and the disciples had shared a meal. They finished, and, and, and Jesus starts to speak. And he says, Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never, never be made to stumble. Said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night, before rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all of the disciples. Have you ever made a commitment like that to God? I'll never do that. I'll never tell a lie. I'll never steal anything. I'll never deny Christ. I'll never. down to Matthew 26, verse 69. So after Jesus made this prediction, they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Christ prayed. He took Peter, James, and John with him. They fell asleep. He woke them up. They fell asleep. He woke them up. The guards came. Judas betrays him. Jesus is arrested. He's taken to the Sanhedrin. Peter follows. Now Peter sat outside the courtyard, and the servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you're talking about. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow is also with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied on an oath, I do not know the man. A 
little while later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear and saying, I don't know the man. And immediately the beast arose and ate him. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so he went out and wept bitterly. Can you imagine the burden of guilt that Peter felt? Once he realized that what he said and what he had done, he just didn't say, I just didn't know him. He swore. He swore and cursed. I don't know this man. You people are crazy. I'm, I'm just here to watch this guy get punished for what he's been doing. Have you ever said or done anything that you regretted so badly that you squeezed the tears and you know, didn't know how to make it right? Maybe it was a harsh word from a parent or a spouse or a child or a friend or a coworker. But as soon as those words left your mouth, as soon as they slipped off your lips, Seventy-five says that when he realized that he went out and wept bitterly. Other words that I found for that are desperately, inconsolably. Peter cried as a child might cry when they think they've done something that they had good parents who thought stopped loving them. Just as a mother or father might cry over a lost child. Moreover, to make matters even worse, Jesus had warned Peter. Jesus had told him. Peter had more faith in himself, in his own strength and ability, than he did in Christ and what his future held. He thought he knew himself better than Jesus did. Do you ever think you know yourself better than Christ does? I'll never do that. I'll never get there. I'll never say that. Have you ever been in a situation where you thought or said it? Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty haughty spirit before the fall. You need to be careful about the words that leave our mouths. However, we do have a loving, kind God, right? He's gracious. He's forgiving. Turn with me to John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, last book of the, the, the four Gospels, chapter 21. And let's see what happens to Peter. At this point, Christ has been crucified been raised from the dead. He's shown himself several times to the disciples. And now they're at the seaside. The Peter and, the, and, his, and his, his disciples have been out fishing. They haven't caught anything. They're coming back and they see this figure on the, on the shore. We're going to pick it up in, um, well, let me finish. We're going to pick it up in 15. But first of all, they, they see Jesus on the shore. They don't recognize him at first until John says to Peter, hey, this, this, it's Jesus. So Peter runs out. They have a meal together meal is over. Verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to them, again, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Then verse 16 says to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, in verse 17, he says to him a third time, Son of Jonah, do you love me? Now, Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. There's very, some very interesting things in there. First of all, do you see it was three times? Peter denied Christ three times. Three times Christ said to him, do you love me? Feed my sheep tend my sheep, take care of my sheep. Three times. The third time, however, Peter is mournful. He's, he's, he's cut to the heart. He's sad. He's distressed. He's afflicted. And his response, Lord, you know all things. Because he's finally realized, oh, when, when he told me I was going to betray him, he knew I was going to betray him. He wasn't guessing. He wasn't statistically speaking what might happen in times of stress. He knew. So Peter's come to the realization that God really does know everything. 
So he knows my heart. And he says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Christ answers him at the last point, I know that you love me. But that God's grace is complete and it, it fills. It covers. He's restored and he's healed. Those are the things that we really each have to acknowledge and, and take those steps of take those steps of grace and give to him. Perhaps one of the greatest examples of grace is the death of Christ on the cross. And his willingness to die for us, and not just to die, but to die on a cross, naked, to be beaten, whipped, pierced, ridiculed, bruised for our sins, for my sins, for your sins. Christ not only defeated sin, but he defeated Satan on that cross. He fulfills the promise of grace and forgiveness that was made to Adam and Eve and to all humankind everywhere. Where else is God's grace going to be fulfilled so thoroughly? It's wonderful to be healed, but his son died for you. Let's not forget that he hung on that cross. Christ offered up one more prayer to his people. Do you remember what he said? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That forgiveness wasn't just for those that were there at the cross. It wasn't just for the Romans. It just it wasn't just for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Jews. It was for all of us, those who know him, those who don't know him, those who reject him, those who hate him, those who ridicule him, those who fail him. He intercedes for us all. He covers us with his righteousness, and he gives us his grace. God's grace is, will be made known in one other way. Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 and 17. In a nutshell, those who have died will be resurrected, given an incorruptible body, and in an instant, those who are still alive, when he returns, will receive a new incorruptible body as well. We'll be caught up in heaven. We'll be reunited with those we love and with Jesus who lives forever. We'll have peace and we'll be covered by his righteousness, filled with his grace for all of eternity. However, his grace doesn't even end there. There, are, there is the sinner. There is those who have rejected him. It extends to them, too. How, you might say. Just because they've been sinned by the devil. And no longer will the devil have control over them. No longer will he have any power over them. No longer will he be able to deceive them, to torment them, because they won't be there anymore. I can't think of more grace. Can you imagine if they were left alive? away somewhere with the devil forever God does not wish any of us to be to be lost we're all his children it pains him when we reject his grace and he asks for our sins but he respects our righteousness and he'll not force anyone to love or to accept him but he'll also never stop trying to keep us for as long as we live or for as long as we stay here on earth however the time is coming will come again, and time will run out, and the last people willing to accept him will receive the gift of eternal life. What do you want to be when that comes? Do you want to receive the grace that leads to eternal life, or the grace that separates you from God forever in the depths of that pit? The choice is yours. The grace is waiting with open arms. theme for this year is watch and pray for Jesus coming again. Will you pray with me, not just for his return, but for those that are lost, those that are seeking him, those that are questioning like Peter, who feels that they've fallen so far from God that God can't reach them? What do you need to know is that you need God's grace to cover your lost sins, to call on God's mercy, to call on God's excellence. They need to know that God's grace favor, his goodwill is for everyone, everyone who desires to receive him. So if you're willing and you desire to share in God's grace, stand with me so that we can pray with you and for you. And if it's your desire to pray for those that are searching, looking, longing for his grace, stand with me also.
if you're watching or you're listening at home and you want to know more about this grace that God has to give, pray with us. If you want to know more, join us. Contact us through the information on the website. God is so much in our lives that we need to confess to you, so many things that we need to lift up to you, so many areas that we struggle, Father, and you stand there with arms wide open, full of
there is yes, Jesus. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.